All right, friends, welcome back. If you've made it this far, it means we've already been outside and shot lots of amazing new pictures on location. Therefore, we have a whole bunch of new raw files that need to go into post-production. Now, I happen to know a bunch of photographers who do not like to edit pictures. Everybody's got their own reasons. I don't like being cooped up in the office. I'd rather be outside shooting more pictures. But the most common thread that we find is that people are intimidated by the software. And this is especially true for new photographers. And it's easy to understand why, because both Photoshop and Lightroom are big programs, and they can be very daunting to the uninitiated. Fortunately, the truth of the matter is, both of these programs are very easy to use. We've created a streamlined workflow that will have you burning through your raw files and creating beautiful new images in no time at all. Final thought, the better the images you shoot in camera, the easier your post-production workflow will be. And since you've been watching our lessons, you're already ahead of the curve. So we're gonna jump into Lightroom first, and then we'll move stuff over into Photoshop for some fine tuning. I personally can't wait to get started. So let's jump right in. All right, friends, welcome into Lightroom. This is it, this is where the magic happens. I know we've been excited to get started on our photo editing workflow, and this is gonna be the beginning of many tutorials in this lesson system that will enable you to start flying through your raw files and really create some beautiful work. Now, some ground notes first. If this is your very first time opening Lightroom, this lesson might start to get a little bit too advanced for you, but not to worry because we have created a 100% free tutorial, a beginner's guide to Lightroom. It's on the Premium Light Academy website. Just navigate to our free tutorial section and do yourself a favor and take that first. Again, if you are absolutely 100% new to Lightroom, this particular lesson is gonna start really sinking its teeth into the photo editing workflow. We don't exactly have time to go through all of the little buttons and all the little parameters and show you everything that Lightroom can do from the ground up from a beginner's perspective. So again, go take that free tutorial if this is your first time. Otherwise, since this is our first lesson in the photo workflow module, I am gonna give us a brief tour, a brief overview of the tools that we'll be using here in Lightroom so again, this lesson assumes that you have, at the very minimum, beginner or intermediate knowledge of Lightroom. I don't want to leave anyone behind, so if you are new to Lightroom, please go and take our free tutorial and then zip right on back over to this lesson. Let's get started. Right now, we are in the library module. If you would direct your attention to the top right of the screen, we can see that we have a library, develop, map, book, slideshow, print, web, and cloud. Now, for this tutorial series, we will only be using these first two, the library and the development module. These two modules will give a photographer everything that he or she needs in order to produce great images. The other stuff, these are new tools that Adobe has added in to give you more ability to kind of categorize your files. You can geotag, you can use them to make kind of a book. They've got this little template where you can put your pictures into a photo book. Slideshow is sort of a modified PowerPoint kind of a thing. Print, web, and cloud services are all stuff that Adobe offers to enable you to print and archive your files. Again, these are not modules that I use on a regular basis. I typically accomplish these things with other customized programs that happen much later down the line in the photo editing workflow. So for our purposes, we'll only be using the library panel and the development module. These two modules give you more than enough power to select all of your favorite images and then edit those images down. All right, so let's start with a quick tour of the library. As you can see here in the middle of the screen, we have a series of thumbnails. These are the images that we've shot in our photo session, and they basically appear in Lightroom in the same succession that they were shot in camera. So as you can see in the middle, we have the lovely Ashley, and these are images that we shot for our premium light tutorials. The library module is basically designed to help you navigate your way through your files. So you can see all the images that you've shot, you can collect them into collections, you can categorize them, and you can kind of get a closer look at what you're working with here. So this is the module that we will use to organize our files. Now, if we take a look over here on the right hand side, we have a little bit of file information. This is actually very important. I can see that this image was shot at ISO 200. The focal length of the lens was 165 millimeters. So it was shot at F 2.8 and at 160th of a second. As we move down, we have even more metadata. Here's the original file name. And if we come down here, we can tell when the image was shot. It's 8,000 pixels by 5,000 pixels, 160th of a second. It even tells us the name of the camera, 5DSR, and the name of the lens. So this is all very handy information if you are interested in ever looking back and understanding how you actually capture that image. Lightroom does a great job of keeping all this metadata intact. All right, now let's zip over to the left-hand side of the screen. As we can see, we have over here a section called Catalog. 
These are all the files that we shot during our boots on the ground tutorial sessions. As I move down, I have synced photographs, I have quick collection. This section right here is gonna be very, very important to our workflow, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. We also have another tab called Previous Import. So if you really wanna sink your teeth into that last photo session that you just did, the Previous Import will enable you to see just that last card that you imported. Moving down, we have a section called Folders, and then another section called Collections. This collection section it will be very important, again, to our workflow as we start to select and categorize our favorite images. All right, I'm gonna move down to the bottom of the screen here. We have a list of icons. The first one is the library view. Basically, it gives us a bunch of thumbnails. If I click on the single image view, this takes me to a full screen shot of the image that is currently selected. Over here, we've got a comparison view, and that's pretty much all that I think that we would be using in this particular module. So let's go back to our thumbnail view. And as I move across the screen to the bottom, I can actually control the size of my thumbnails. Right now they are at maximum size. I kind of like them at maximum size because it gives me a little bit more detailed image of what I'm looking at. But as we slide this slider off to the left, our thumbnails get quite a bit smaller. And this enables us to see more of a 40,000 foot view of our photo session. As you can see, if I need to navigate to a specific section of images that we've shot, this is probably the way to do it. You can see here, Ashley has undergone a number of wardrobe changes. We actually have a series of location changes. And as I scroll down, I'm starting to see a big picture of all the images that we've shot for these premium light tutorials. This is handy if I say, all right, I need to navigate to the part where Ashley has the yellow dress. Now, as I get down here, I can see Ashley is wearing her yellow dress. So if I hone in on one of these images, and then I grab my thumbnails and I move back in, then we can kind of really start to zone in on this particular area. Now the yellow dress was the first lesson that we shot in the program. And so these are the images that we will be focusing on for this particular tutorial. All right, so as you can see, the library gives us some basic information for navigating around and understanding how our files were shot. So let's scroll right on back up to the top of our yellow dress images, and we will begin selecting our favorites. So Lightroom plays a lot of different roles in the photo editing world. It enables us to select our favorite images and keep them organized, and it also enables us to edit those images. So starting off right here, we can see up in the top left, we have our test shot. This, the dreaded menu has once again made an appearance. And as we start to scroll through, we can see this is the beginning of our image set. So what I wanna do is start selecting the best images of this particular session so that we can hone them down into a selection that we can edit. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna double click on this initial image. And in doing so, it takes me to a full screen version. You can see this is our beautiful pavilion in Manitou. And if I look down here at the bottom of the screen, I have a series of thumbnails that go across. Now this enables me to keep navigating through my images. So what I like to do is I like to keep my mouse kind of right in the center of the screen here, and then I'm gonna use the arrow keys on the keyboard to start moving through these images. And as we move to the right, we can see this is, some, this is our initial image. It looks a little underexposed, and that's okay. So we're gonna keep moving on, and we can see this is how we kind of got started. Now, when I come to an image that I really like, we need to be able to isolate this image and place it into its own section. Now, Lightroom has a really, really ingenious way of doing this. I'm gonna to touch the B key on the keyboard and watch what happens. We see a sign called Add to Quick Collection. So what Lightroom has done is it has automatically segregated this image over into our Quick Collection. If I click here, I can see that I now have one single image in my Quick Collection. Let's go back to the main library and keep making selections. So I'm gonna double click here and I'm gonna use the arrow key to toggle through. And let's say I like this image again, so I'm gonna hit the B key, move that into the quick collection. And as we go along, we've got a couple other things. This is kind of a, this is kind of a cool looking image. I think I'm gonna add that one, pretty cute. Add to quick collection, we move quite along a little bit here. That's a nice looking image there. Add to quick collection, okay. Now here is an example of an image that we probably would not add to the quick collection. As you can see, there is a lot of motion blur happening. If I hold my mouse right into the center here and I touch one time, Lightroom zooms us into full pixel mode. This is basically the full resolution that the camera gave us right out of the bat. And I'm looking at it in a one-to-one -one ratio. As you can see, there is a huge amount of motion blur going on. And this is likely due to me accidentally kind of flicking my wrist as I hit the shutter button and twitching that camera just enough to peel off a huge amount of shutter shake. 
It's probably a combination of two things. Ashley is actually a very accomplished model and she's always moving, which means that she was probably making a little bit of a motion to go into her next movement. And at the same time, I probably had a pretty good amount of shutter shake. So this is an example of an image that we would not add to our quick collection. When you shoot a lot of frames, this is what happens. So moving right along, actually the very next image is really quite good. So I'm gonna add that to our quick collection. And as we go through, I'm gonna keep hitting the B key every time that I am struck by an image that I really like. Now, as we come back into this section here, we can see, let's take a look at this image. If you will recall from the lesson, we shot an image at F11. When I look over here on my parameters, I can see that the ISO is at 1600, 145 millimeter focal length, F11, 160th of a second. Now, these are not ideal portrait settings, but we did this to show the difference between a large depth of field and a shallow depth of field. As you can see, I can just about start to read that dreaded menu in the background here. And as we zoom in on this image, you can tell that there is actually quite a bit of grain happening in here, especially when I look over into this section here where we have a low contrast. That's, that is an effect of a high ISO. In order to shoot at a larger depth of field, F11, we have to increase our ISO to allow the sensor to become more sensitive to light because there's less light coming in through that really tiny hole in the iris. And as you can see, it's introduced a lot of grain into our image. This is not an ideal situation for portraits, but again, it was shown as an example, mostly of how the difference between F11 and F2.8 looks. Personally, I like a shallow contracted depth of field because it gives us that kind of beautiful dreamy effect to our image. All right, moving right along, I'm gonna go back down to my thumbnails and we're gonna keep moving forward. These are still a couple of sample shots that were shot at F11. And as we keep going, eventually we get back to our original settings. If we look over here, we're now at ISO 160, 200 millimeter focal length, F3.2. So we've gone ahead and expanded that iris way back open to give us that shallow, creamy depth of field. So we're back in our original portrait mode. Now, this is an okay image. I'm not crazy about the, her expression. She was probably kind of in between movements here. But as we move through, we can see, this is a lovely image. I like it when she's not paying attention to the camera. But as you can see, I didn't do a very good job of directing Ashley in this one. Her hand goes straight up out of the frame and it clips off right at the wrist. This looks like a bit of an egregious mistake to me. And if I had it to do again, I believe I would probably give her better direction and say, hey, let's move that hand down so that we can see it in the frame. And I think that we actually did accomplish that as we move through these images a little bit more. Yep, the hand's coming down. And then here, we've actually gone through another little series of directions that says, all right, let's get that hand even with your face so that you have both hands and your face in the image, which makes for a much more pleasing composition. As we go through some of these, we can see Ashley is moving around constantly, and here we are kind of back to a different setup. So as we continue to move through these files, I'm gonna keep going through until I find stuff that I really like, and when I see an image, I'm gonna hit the B key and add it over to the quick collection. Now, in order to expedite this, I don't think that we need to go through all 300 images, but it's important to see the workflow process. I kind of run on instinct a little bit initially, and as we see over here, when I navigate up into my quick collection, I now have seven files. All right, these are images that I have just selected out. So as you can see, our first round of selections are starting to take shape nicely. Now, I am going to go through the rest of these images and build out a nice looking quick collection catalog. I don't think it's necessary to go through every single image. So in the interest of expediting this lesson, we'll use the magic of video editing to skip ahead just a few minutes in time. All right, friends, welcome back. We have just zipped forward in time. I've gone through all 300 images from the yellow dress photo session, and I have selected my 11 favorite files. As you can see, we got a little bit of variety here. There's some nice smiling. We got a little bit of a smolder, and we even have some medium shots to top things off for a little extra variety. Now, as you can see, some of these images actually look very similar to one another, and I don't think that we need to have images that are almost identical. These two in the very beginning are a good example. This means that we need to hone our final selections down once more in order to get the absolute best of the best. So I have these 11 images in my quick collection and what we need to do is create a new organizational structure. So I'm gonna go down here to our collections and I'm gonna add a new collection. By clicking on this plus tab, I can say create collection and I'm gonna call this Ashley Yellow Dress First Cut. And I'm gonna say create and that's going to create an empty folder right over here we can see on the left. 
So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to my quick collection. I'm going to select all of these images and I'm going to drag them into that first cut. Boom, right there. So I now have 11 images in my first cut. Let's deselect these files by clicking over here in the gray area. And while I'm in my collections, I'm going to add yet another folder. Create collection, and I'm going to call this Ash Lee Yellow Dress Finals. Create. And I now have a new folder called Ashley Yellow Dress Finals. It contains zero images. So basically what we need to do now is recreate our photo editing process using the quick collection and then once we have our final files we'll drop them into the finals folder so let's go back up to the quick collection first I'm gonna select all of these images and I'm just gonna hit the delete key now that does not delete them from Lightroom all it does is it removes them from the quick collection so when I navigate back over to my first cut folder here, I still have my 11 files, which I just added in. And now it's time for us to go through these images and pick out our final selections. So we're basically just re-engineering the same process as before, only instead of going through 300 images, we only have to go through 11. And this is where we need to pick out the absolute best of the best. All right, so some of my images have gotten a little bit out of order, so I'm gonna go ahead and grab these two smiling images, and I'm gonna click and drag them over so that they appear at the beginning. This way I have my smiling images first, and then we go into our smolder, more smolder. Here we have a nice medium shot. There's another medium, kind of almost a wide shot. Here it actually is leaning up against the wall, and then we finish off with more of a wide shot there. Okay, so up until now, we've basically just made a cursory glance at these images. We've followed our instincts and picked our favorites based on how we're making an emotional connection or at least a, a, a fundamental compositional connection. But now it's time to dig a little deeper. I'm gonna go in and double click on my first file. And what we need to do is we need to make sure that this file is technically proficient enough to make it into the next round. And by that, I'm basically talking about sharpness. If a portrait does not have razor sharpness on the eyes, then you can't use it. Sorry, it's inevitable. Every once in a while, you're gonna get stuff out of focus and quite often it ends up being one of your favorite images, but you just gotta grit your teeth and move along. That's why we shoot a lot of frames. So in order to check for sharpness and check for technical details, I like to take my mouse, I hover right in between the eyes and I click one time. This should give us a full size preview of how the camera shot the image. Now I wanna direct your attention down to this little tab right here. It says embedded preview. What this means is that Lightroom is basically giving us a facsimile of this file. We're not actually looking at the real raw capture of this image. Lightroom has a lot of tips and tricks that it does in order to increase speed. So we're basically looking at, like I say, a facsimile of the real raw file. As you can see, this image looks a tiny bit soft and it's easy for you to go through your entire library and start thinking, oh my gosh, did I get every last file out of focus? No, you didn't. This is basically just Lightroom trying to boost a little bit of speed so that it can show you these full size images in a quicker manner. If we wanna see the actual raw file, the actual pixels that the camera captured, we need to go up to the development module. When I click this button, watch what happens. We actually get a much sharper preview because this is the real image that the camera captured. Notice my embedded preview tab has now disappeared. Lightroom is now showing me the actual image that came out of the camera. So when we are making our final decisions on sharpness and technical details, we wanna make sure that we are in the development module. While we're here, let's take a quick tour of the development module. I'm gonna back out so that we're kind of looking at our full composition. Over here on the right-hand side, we have a series of tools. We have exposure, contrast, highlights, shadows. Basically, this is just a series of sliders. If I take my exposure down to the left, it makes the image darker. Go to the right, makes the image brighter. Exposure is one of the most powerful tools you can use because if you don't hit your exposure dead on in the raw file, it's okay. Raw files have a huge amount of information and there's a lot of latitude that you can use to brighten or darken up your file, recover highlights, boost up a couple of shadows. The same is true. We've got highlight sliders that target just the highlights in the image, shadow slider that targets just the shadows, blacks, whites. Lightroom has the ability to really give us some fine tuning on our final editing focus. Once we get done with selecting our images, we will then go through and start editing our images using this development module. Now I'm gonna go down here and hit the reset button. And as you can see, all the sliders will go back to normal and the raw file will continue to be as it was shot. 
This is a very important aspect to Lightroom. Lightroom does what we call non-destructive editing. I can go into this file and I can drag my slider up and around. And let's say that I just accidentally blow these highlights out. Well, basically what's happening right now, Lightroom is not actually affecting the physical pixels in the raw file. It's basically just creating an algorithm that sits on top of the image and it allows us to bring that back at any time. So if I were to drastically underexpose an image by accident, I get up, I leave, I go on a trip, six weeks later, I come back, I can still grab that slider and recover those highlights because Lightroom is not actually physically affecting the raw data. The raw file is never touched. It's a process called non-destructive editing editing, and it's a very powerful way to make sure that you're not getting yourself in trouble. The very early days of photo editing were not necessarily like this. It was actually quite easy to damage your files. Lightroom, however, does not affect the actual raw file at all. It basically just creates an algorithm that lives on top, and it allows you to always go back and make changes. So that's just a quick look into the development panel. I'm going to hit the G key on the keyboard. This will automatically take me back to my library and my thumbnails view. So I'm going to increase these thumbnails. Let's get a nice larger preview. And what I want to do now is I want to go through and start making my absolute final selections of the images that we're going to edit in Lightroom and then later move into Photoshop. So we double click on our first image. Let's get a good look. I am actually going to do this in the development module. So I am able to look at the full raw file. I want to make sure that as I check for sharpness, I get the real deal. That one looks pretty good. I'm going to use the right arrow key and move over one to our almost identical image. And as you can see, this one is also nice and sharp. So in order to choose between the two, let's go back out. Let's just use the arrow keys to toggle back and forth. I feel like I might like this one a little bit better. Her head is tilted up. She's kind of a little bit more facing the audience. And this one, I feel like her smile actually cracked open a little bit better and it might be a tad more engaging. So out of the two, I'm just gonna go ahead with my gut and select this one. I'm gonna hit the B key and it is once again gonna add this image to my now empty quick collection. So let's move right along. All right, we've got a little bit of the smolder going on here. Let's look at these at full pixels. That seems to be nice and sharp. So we move along. Aha, now here we go. So we've got two smolder pictures right next to each other. This one is nice and sharp. This one is not sharp. There's obviously a great deal of shutter shake. I probably got a little twitchy when I was hitting the shutter on this one. So this is not an image that we would keep. So let's move back out. And let's see here, of these three, I kind of like the one where she's got her head flipped back a little bit. It's got this sort of flirty, fun assertiveness to it. And when I look at this one full size, this one is in fact razor sharp. This, this eye, her skin tones are all nice. So I'm gonna zoom back out, hit the B key, and send that one to the quick collection as well. Moving right along, here we have kind of another smolder picture. She's got her shoulder punched up a little bit here. That's kind of fun and flirty. Let's see how we did here. That is nice and sharp. So I'm gonna add that one as well as one of my finals. Okay, now this image, no other image in the collection is like this at all. I think I actually just hit the button while Ashley was maybe taking a breather and we got a very beautiful kind of private candid moment. Uh, let's see here, when we zoom in, we do have a nice sharp image on the eye. So I am gonna in fact keep that one. Let's hit the B key, send that to the quick collection. Moving over here, this is a fun, flirty, engaging little picture. It's a little bit too wide for my personal liking. I know that JT likes to shoot wide. This starts to take me a little bit out of my comfort zone, but it's different from the other images that we shot. Again, the dreaded menu is making an appearance here. But if we zoom in, we actually do not have 100 million percent razor sharpness. But at this level, Ashley is actually so far back in the scene that I don't think it's going to be too huge of a problem. So I'm going to add this one as well. Moving right along, we're going to have two images that are Ashley up on the wall. And I think let's probably go with the smiley image. I think I like that one better compositionally or just emotionally. Uh, it is in fact nice and razor sharp. So that's a keeper. We hit the B key there. And then when I move over to this one, I actually get two Ashleys for the price of one. She's reflecting in the window here. That's pretty interesting. And then we've got a nice little smile here. Zoom on in. She is nice and razor sharp there. So I'm going to hit the B key and keep that one as well. All right, so let's pull back to our thumbnail view once again. I'm going to go over here. We are currently in the first cut folder, and I'm going to go up here to our quick collection where we have now made our final edits. And I feel like this is a pretty good selection. We've honed it down from 300 images all the way down to seven finals. 
Now, as these are our final selections, I would like to move them into my Final Cut folder. So I'm gonna hit Command A, select all of these images, and I'm just gonna grab and drag them into the Yellow Dress Finals. Now, when I click on this folder, I am left with my Ashley Final Cut files. And now that the photo selection process is done, it's time for us to move into the development module and start making some creative edits to our files. This is where things get really fun. All right, now it's time for the fun part. We have very diligently made our selections. We've honed our images down to the final seven and we're ready to start editing our images. This is where we can get creative. This is where we can start shaping the way that an image looks through light and contrast and composition. So as you can see over here, we are in the Ashley Yellow Dress Finals. There are seven images in our final collection. And what I wanna do is jump right into the development module and get started. So here we have our very first image. Now, rather than kind of go through and show you every single tool that we have in the development module, I'm just gonna use the tools that I would normally use. I think it's very rare that a photographer would use every single tool in this module on a picture. Yes, you may use every single tool throughout your photography career, but I think it would be very rare that you would use every last one of these options on a single image. Fortunately, this image is actually really good right out of the camera, so we don't have to do a whole lot to it. Now, before we launch into the fine tuning, I wanna scroll down to this section here. We have a section called Lens Corrections, and Lightroom has two really interesting buttons that enable us to enable profile corrections or remove chromatic aberration. Now, chromatic aberration is kind of a phenomenon that happened in slightly older lenses for the most part. You got this weird light fringing that happened around the peripheral of the lens. We don't see a whole lot of that in telephoto work because a telephoto lens doesn't really create a great deal of barreling or distortion. But all the same, it's fun to click that button anyway. I don't think we're gonna see a whole lot of change, and we really don't, but down here in it where it says enable profile corrections, this actually is a pretty interesting button. All right, let's take a minute to talk about profile corrections. Basically, your lens is a sphere, and it creates a spherical image that the image sensor captures a square out of the center of that spherical image. This is a lot more prevalent in wide angle lenses where you start to see the edges of the, of the image start to barrel out and turn a little bit round. Telephoto lenses don't really have that problem quite so much, but all the same, this camera captured this image using a spherical piece of glass. And so it does have kind of spherical qualities to it. When I click this button, you'll see that the image gets a little bit brighter and it actually punches in ever so slightly. So what this has done is it has eliminated the vignetting that happens around the outside of the image and basically kind of flattened it out a little bit. Now, most people need to make a creative decision on this. As we toggle back and forth, I honestly think I like the original version better than the so-called corrected version. So in this case, I'm gonna leave that button turned off. So let's go back up to the top and we'll get a look at our other tools here. The first thing we come to is color temperature. Basically, we move this slider to the left, we get a little cooler, we move it to the right, we kind of get nuclear hot. I think this image was actually captured in a pretty good spot, so I'm gonna leave that alone for the most part. Color temperature is a really cool creative tool that you can use. If we bring this down a little bit, it almost looks like this image was shot at nighttime, even though it was shot early in the morning. If we bring it up a little bit, we get kind of a little bit more crispy warm effect I don't know how much you wanna go on that level. Color temperature tends to be a bit of a creative decision as long as you're not going too far to where you start to burn out those skin tones and make people look like they're nuclear mashed potatoes. You wanna be careful with sliding around on the color temperature because if you get too far on either end, you're gonna make your people look like they just got irradiated by a nuclear bomb. So if ever you get a little crazy on one of your sliders and you don't know where it goes back to normal, you can always come down here and hit the reset button and that will basically put us right back to the original raw file. Again, I feel like this image is pretty darn good straight out of the camera, so let's just go through a couple of basics. I usually like to start with the exposure slider. Again, this makes the image overall brighter and darker. I can go in here, I can type in any number I want. That gets us back to normal. I'm gonna put in a, about a 0.25%. That's gonna brighten the image up just a little bit. I felt like it was ever so slightly underexposed, and now I can kind of see that Ashley's face is a little bit brighter, it's a little bit more engaging. So that's a good edit there. I typically don't do anything with contrast when it comes to portraits of people. You don't wanna have lots of contrast in someone's skin tones that tends to look really unnatural and kind of crazy burnout. So I typically leave contrast alone when it comes to portraits. 
Highlights. Highlights tend to burn out a little bit, although in this case, they actually look pretty good. So if I drag my highlight slider down, I can see some of the information in Ashley's hand up there going up and down. I can see some of the information in the back wiggling around a little bit. I don't know that we need to mess with our highlights too much. I'm actually going to add maybe just two. We'll bring them up a little bit in this case. Shadows. Shadows affect clearly the darker sections of the image, the, the pane of glass in behind her and along with her hair and along with her eyes. You want to be careful about dragging your shadows too far down because if we lose all of the information in Ashley's eyes, she tends to look like a shark and you don't want that. You want your people to look like people, not like Jaws. So shadows, I'm going to leave those at zero just for now because again, I feel like this is a very well balanced image. Whites enable us to target more or less mid-tones. So this is kind of a level that you can do to kind of punch up a little bit of extra skin. If you if her skin is ever so slightly too dark, I would probably put my whites at about a two there as well. Blacks, same thing as shadow. They kind of target that shadow information. If you're really clever, you can get your shadows and your blacks to work together. Uh, but I don't want to overdo it in this case. So as we move down, there is two very important sliders that we want to make sure that we are very subtle and careful with the vibrance and the saturation it never fails people who are new to lightroom or new to photography they tend to go a little crazy on the saturation slider and your images end up looking again like they've been irradiated like by a nuclear bomb either that or that she actually sat in a nuclear tanning booth for about six hours so when it comes to saturation and skin tones and people, I tend to leave that right at a baseline of zero. You don't want to have oversaturated skin because that's the quickest invite to amateur hour. Later on, when we move into Photoshop, I'm actually going to take a little bit of color out of her skin because again, I think these cameras tend to punch a little bit too much color saturation in just right at the raw level. So moving down, we have a nice tone curve. We can use this to create a nice S curve. Watch what happens to the curve here. We've got this S curve going on that tends to give you kind of a nice contrasty image. Um, and again, this is something that I will probably focus on a lot more in Photoshop. I don't do a great deal of S curves in Lightroom. As you can see, Ashley is looking a little bit burned out, a little bit too color saturated, a little bit too contrasty. So I'm gonna go through and reset all of these back into zero because they look pretty good as is. All right, so that's our tone curve. Now, moving down, we've gone through our lens corrections. I wanna take a look at hue saturation luminance. Okay, this color panel is a very, very, very powerful tool for editing, especially when it comes to portraits. Basically what this does is this allows you to target specific colors in the image and then use those sliders to map out that color the way you want. So for instance, if I grab this orange slider, uh, luminance basically means brightness. So if I go to the left, things get darker. If I go to the right, things get brighter. But basically the reason that this is important is it allows me to target a specific color and then use that color to affect the tone or brightness of the image. Now, skin tones tend to have a lot of orange in their RGB makeup. So if I move my, co my color slider to the left, Ashley gets kind of a suntan. If I move it to the right, she turns into a little bit more of a vampire. Again, we want to be careful with these sliders. I never go more than plus or minus seven points on any of these sliders. That's just because if you get too crazy with them, you're going to end up with a way oversaturated, weird looking picture. So when in doubt, keep it on the baseline. Again, I don't think that we need to do a whole lot in here. If we look at color saturation, I can actually target just the reds. And if I boost up that color saturation, you can see kind of behind her, there's a little bit of stuff going on. Orange is where we're going to really see a lot of color. She kind of turns into an Oompa Loompa on the right hand side. And if we go left, actually really, really desaturates almost into a weird looking black and white. So color saturation, this is a really powerful tool that enables you to target specific colors in the image and affect their saturation level. Hue is also another thing. Basically, hue enables us to target a specific color and change it to a different color. So if I grab the orange slider here and there is a lot of orange in her color matrix and I move this to the right, she's going to turn a little bit green. And if I go to the left, she's going to turn a little bit red. So basically what this is doing is this is manipulating the the actual color, the hue of the color. So with these tabs, again, I'm gonna zero a lot of this stuff out because with portraiture, I feel like subtlety is key. Now we haven't really done a whole lot to this image just yet, but I do want to make some nice creative edits. So I feel like a good portrait enables the viewer to really focus in on just the person. And a really good way to do that is to make the person's surroundings a little bit darker than the person. 
So for instance, this wall behind Ashley, if we can make this a little bit darker, then she, by contrast, will pop out a little bit more and be more prevalent to the viewer. So we have a series of tools up here in the development module, which are very powerful. This square right here is gonna open up our gradient, our graduated neutral density filter, which is a really, really cool tool. So when I come out into the scene here and I hover, you notice that my mouse has become a little plus sign. Basically what I can do is I can click and drag. I'm gonna start on the left and I'm gonna click and drag from this direction over here. And I'm creating a graduated neutral density filter. And when I let go, that filter kind of comes to life. Now, nothing much has happened just yet because I haven't told that filter what to do. But let's say if I grab my exposure tab and I start to drag that down, you can see that on the left side of the frame, we're really getting darker and that gradually moves to brighter as it goes from left to right. So this enables me to kind of darken that, le that left side of the screen make that a little bit darker so that the viewer doesn't really pay as much attention to it and then the viewer is thereby forced to kind of be a little bit more focused in on Ashley. Now as you can see down here in the left we're kind of burning her elbow down a little bit so we might want to ease off of that edit a little bit. Let's go back to kind of around there. I can also change the direction that this thing goes in so if I grab right here in the over on the, the middle I can actually change the way, whoopsie, we've just started a new one. Hang on, Command Z. I can actually, let's start a new one just to kind of showcase what's going on here. I will actually click on this one and delete it and we'll start a new one. So you can change these graduated neutral density filters in any direction that you want. So I'm gonna kind of start this one up here and get it to where it's not quite affecting Ashley's body as much as it is the background. So now when I kind of drag my color, my exposure slider down a little bit, I'm making just that corner a little bit darker. So that's a pretty cool edit right there. I can also change the color temperature of just that section, which is kind of neat. I might boost that one up just a couple of points to make that background a little bit more orange. So I'm gonna come over here to this wall and I'm gonna create another graduated neutral density filter. And I'm just gonna kind of drag that over a little bit until it starts to get into Ashley. So this new filter has adopted the parameters of the previous filter. So you can see I'm still at minus 0.76 on the exposure. And what that does is it just kind of darkens that wall down. So I've created some darkness on the right and I've created some darkness on the left and that allows the viewer to really kind of focus in on just Ashley because she's a little bit brighter than her scene is now. Okay, so while we are targeting specific areas, let's kind of get a look at Ashley's face. Um, I would like to see a little bit more brightness in her eyes. We did in fact shoot this with no light modifiers, no flash, no fill flash, nothing but natural light. And so sometimes we have to go back into our raw file and punch out those eyes just a little bit because we see some catch lights in here, but I don't have them in there entirely. And I think we can do a little bit better. So I'm gonna close our graduated neutral density filter panel and I'm gonna open our circular neutral density filter. So for this, we're just gonna create two little baby circles and I can kind of grab them and guide them and change them around so that they're roughly the shape of Ashley's eyes and I can actually brighten just that one tiny section of the image just like that. So Lightroom has some really nice specific close focus editing capabilities. Now we don't want to overdo this. This is it's easy to overdo the eyes and if your eyes are extra super bright people are going to pick up and be like what is going on is she some kind of vampire? So I'm going to pull this in at about 0.3 I think that's gonna, probably a pretty good edit. Let's move it over just a little bit. I'm gonna create yet another one on her other eye. And let's just kind of angle that a little bit. Again, we'll bring this one in at 0.3. And when I close this back up, and let's just kind of zoom in on Ashley. Now her eyes are actually quite a bit brighter. So let's zoom back out. So this is a pretty good initial series of edits. I, like I say, we, we shot a pretty great image right out of the camera and I don't think there was a whole heck of a lot that we had to do to it. There's definitely some fine touching stuff that we'll do in Photoshop, but that will come in our next tutorial. So let's switch over to our next image. I'll edit one more of these for us in Lightroom and then we'll export these and get a look at what happens in Photoshop. 
Okay, so here again, I'm just gonna go through this process kind of a little bit faster. Right now, Ashley has turned her back to the wall. There is a lot of sunlight that was coming into the scene from over in this direction, and it's kind of coming into her face quite a bit nicer. So her face is much better lit than it was in the previous image. So I'm not gonna have to really bring any highlights up at all. She's got a little bit of a highlight going down the middle of her nose here. So I'm gonna start over here, and I'm gonna pull my highlights down just a little bit. If I pull them all the way, you can see that highlight slider is really affecting just the brightest tones in the image but again subtlety is key so i'm going to bring this down maybe about 20 points and call it good right there uh, the overall exposure again i'm going to punch that up just maybe 0.2 type that in that's a good edit there uh, i don't need to mess with color saturation or anything else i don't know that we need to really hone in on any of our colors because i feel like the tonality of this image is nice and even i am just going to make some kind of creative adjustments here and bring in another neutral density filter on this side let's bring that down a little bit and that should really kind of start to darken out that wall and make ashley pop i'm gonna do another one on the right that's a little bit too strong i don't think we need it to be that strong so minus two is a bit much let's dial this back to just maybe minus yeah, one give or take and now as you can see just with those two neutral density filters ashley is absolutely popping out of this picture she's very vibrant i think i overdid it on the left so i'm going to go back here dial this one back to about i don't know let's call it 1.5 type that in whoopsie i actually went up the wrong way sorry but that's a good that's a good example you can see your new, your graduated neutral density filters they can go up really bright or they can go down really dark so let's slide this down to about minus 1.5 and that's a little bit more of a subtle edit okay once again i think i will actually let's close this panel i will zoom in on her face and we're going to punch just a tad little bit more light into her eyes so i'm going to grab my circular neutral density filter and i'm just going to create what looks like about an eyeball and let's angle it over here and now that we're zoomed in you can actually see how this filter works a little bit more again really all that you need for the most part is exposure uh, if we bring the exposure way up ashley turns into some kind of like crazy vampire who can see in the dark if you bring it all the way down she turns into a shark so we want to get somewhere in the middle i just want to bring that up enough to give her eyes a little bit more life so i'm just going to go up type in 0.5 that looks like a good edit there down here let's do the same I want to make sure that we don't overdo this eye too much so again i'm just going to type in 0.5 and that looks like a pretty good edit right there. Okay, so I'm gonna close our circular graduated neutral density filter and I'm gonna zoom back out. And basically this gives us kind of a, a, a good first round of edits. Lightroom has enabled us to very quickly change the tonality of this image and I think it's off to a really great start. So when we talk about skin retouching, that's gonna be a job for Photoshop. We will of course go through and export these images, turn them into Photoshop documents and do lots of really beautiful fine tuning on Ashley's skin. She has really great skin to begin with, so we're not gonna have a great deal of work to do, but there's always something. You want your image to be as perfect as you possibly can. All right, I'm gonna hit the G key on the keyboard. I'm gonna go back out to my main library where I'm looking once again at all of my thumbnails. Um, I think we've got some pretty good edits so far. I wanna do one final thing. I'm gonna come down to this image here and show a little bit of cropping. Right now, I have basically framed Ashley up in the dead center of the image. I love the way she looks. Her hand are beautifully placed. She's got this beautiful, engaging expression. She looks a little bit underexposed to me, so let's jump into this image quick and actually get this baby dialed in. So, development module. Before we do any of our light and tonality, I wanna get the composition dialed in to a place that I like it. The dreaded menu is of course here. There's nothing I can do about that in Lightroom. If we really wanna get diligent, we can kinda of burn it out in Photoshop. We can clone that thing out. Um, but I don't think most people are gonna notice that for right now because Ashley is actually very engaging in this picture. So first, we're gonna do a bit of cropping. Now, I don't usually like to crop images. I feel that it's very necessary for photographers to do their best to crop in camera. That way you're not losing any pixel information later. If I grab this crop tool and I make this image smaller, I'm basically cutting off a lot of the megapixels. Now, if I need to blow this image up and make it really big, I typically don't wanna crop in too tight because the more you crop, the more megapixel horsepower you tend to lose. Let's actually maybe bring it up just a little bit more right there. Lightroom has an excellent crop tool. Basically, if I come over to the side, um, I can kind of turn this thing, I can rotate it. And what I like to do is I like to use this grid system, line it up with a straight line right there in the middle next to the menu. And when I let that go, now I've kind of 
straightened up this image. If you want to get creative and make it a little sideways, you can kind of cant your image over to one side. And basically all of our once straight lines now become diagonal lines. And that can actually be kind of a cool little creative trick. Let's actually see what that looks like. I'm going to hit the enter key and we'll return that. And so now basically I have Ashley, she's up against this wall and all of my straight up and down lines have become these vertical lines. Now in this case, I don't know if it's working for me. I feel like that's almost a little bit unsettling. So I'm gonna command Z, undo that, and we're just gonna kinda of keep it at more of a normal angle for this part. So we can just finish this image off again. She looks slightly underexposed. So I'm gonna grab our exposure slider, bring that up overall just a little bit. I usually don't like to go more than one full stop. Uh, a lot of modern cameras have a great deal of power and they can put a lot of exposure balancing in after the fact. I typically try to keep my exposure within one stop. I'm actually gonna go a little bit less here. Let's go with 0.35, that looks good. Our highlights are getting a little out of hand right now. I can see a bunch of them popping out on her shoulder and on her hand up here and in the background. So we're gonna bring our highlights down just a little bit. I'm gonna add a little bit of shadow, bring those down, bring these shadows down, and then the whites, those are actually gonna go up just a little bit because the whites are gonna target the mid-tones and that's gonna keep her skin looking kind of nice and vibrant there. All right, once again, let's throw a graduated neutral density filter over here to the left because I wanna darken that section down, drag that down a little bit so that we keep our focus on Ashley where it belongs, and then I'm gonna do another one right here on this wall. That looks good there. And let's see here, she's still looking a little bit too suntan, a little bit too dark. So let's close up this panel, open up our circular neutral density filter. And I'm just gonna put kind of a big basic one right on her face so that her face can get a little bit of extra brightness without affecting the rest of the image. Let's bring that, okay, we go up too high, she gets too bright. So again, subtlety is key. I'm gonna bring this up about, yeah call it 0.4. I feel like that gives us a little bit of a better angle on that. So we'll close this panel. This image is feeling a little bit warm to me. So I'm going to actually grab my color temperature slider and bring it down just a bit, just a tad. I feel like that's a good edit right there. Okay. So for the most part, that's a pretty good edit. We've cropped in a little bit because I shot slightly too wide. Now we still have, you know, Ashley fills the frame nicely. She's got a good composition. She has this beautiful, flirty, engaging, look on her face. And so I feel like that is a pretty good edit. So we hit the G key, we come back out, we've got some nice edits going on. This is essentially the Lightroom workflow that I would go through. I would go through each of these images and basically kind of make take a little creative license on how the sides get a little darker and the middle gets a little brighter to help Ashley pop out. But for the most part, that's all we need to do because again, we shot great images to begin with. We don't have to do a whole lot of recovery and damage control. So those are some basic Lightroom edits. I'm gonna take the three images that we edited and I'm gonna drag and move them so that they're all adjacent to one another. And then I'm going to select these three images and I'm going to export them into Photoshop. So when we come down into our export tab, let's pop this guy open here. And I basically have the ability, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select where I want these images to go. So let's choose a folder. We should have on the desktop, we've got Ashley and Manitou. We're gonna aim this at our Photoshop documents folder. As you can see, we have a bunch of images in here already for this tutorial series. So I'm gonna choose that. I'm going to tell these images, I'm gonna give them a name. So this is, this is a very important part of Lightroom right here. Custom name and sequence. This is what I use right here. This basically allows me to type in a name. And then if I do three pictures or 10 pictures or 100 pictures, Lightroom will give them numbers. So it'll be, you know, Ashley yellow, yellow dress dash one, dash two, dash three, and so forth. So custom name and sequence, whatever you do, we have lots of chapters on organization in previous lessons. Please do not let the camera name your file. You, the camera comes up with a file that looks kind of like that, right? That means absolutely nothing. You will never be able to find that file. So don't let the camera name your files. We're going to name our file Ashley yellow dress and that should be pretty good right there okay so we've given it a name we've told it where we want it to go now let's give it a format right now we are formatted as a photoshop document lightroom can export jpegs tiffs you can actually export the original files for right now we want a photoshop document because that's the next step in the process that we'll be doing color space you always want to use adobe 1998 because it gives you the most amount of color information bit depth 
You can go with 16-bit color. I don't think it's really necessary for portraits. 16-bit color is important if you're doing landscape stuff and you have a lot of blue skies and plain gradients like that. 8-bit color is going to be perfectly sufficient for what we're working on here. A lot of photographers will argue that you should always do 16-bit color. I disagree. It makes the file size absolutely gigantic and hard to manage. In this case, 8-bit color is going to be just fine. Image sizing, we don't want to mess with image sizing. Right now, Lightroom is automatically defaulted to send out full size images. If I were to click resize to fit, Lightroom would say, okay, you're going to spit out a tiny file that's 1600 pixels wide by 1600 pixels tall. And we'd effectively be destroying all of those beautiful 8,000 pixels from our gigantic 50 megapixel camera. So leave that turned off. Lightroom will automatically send out your largest file size by default. So we've told the file where to go. We've told the Lightroom what to call the file. We've given it a format and we've told it to keep its initial size. So now when I hit export, Lightroom is gonna send these first three pictures over to my Photoshop documents folder. And at that point, we will be ready to jump into Photoshop for some fine tuning. So be sure to stay tuned for the next lesson. We actually got a lot of work done here in Lightroom, but I'm excited to move on to Photoshop for the final retouches. It's gonna look amazing.